I guess today we will raise more questions uh, than answer. Um, and I think that uh, we're trying to understand and strike the balance between a number of, of things. One is one a balance between uh, profit and quality, between uh, selectivity and access, between global and local, and between competition and collaboration. But I think the challenge is not to select between those uh, dichotomies, but rather to insist on achieving all of them. Um, our day today, our day, -day, our day today, uh, will move on uh, after uh, this brief uh, introduction. We will have um, uh, Dr. Jason Lane from uh, Department Chair and Associate uh, uh, Professor in the Department of Education, Policy and Leadership, University of Albany, State University of New York. Um, uh, and he will talk to us about IBC models and educate us about uh, the different types and uh, uh, benefits of IBC models. After that, we will have a break, followed by a press conference for about an hour. And then we will move on to uh, our uh, guest speakers who will give us the international experiences with IBC. We have uh, 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 Dr. Patrick Hackett, Deputy Vice Chancellor, University of Liverpool. We have uh, Kelly Otter, Dean, uh, of the School of Continuing Studies at Georgetown University, followed by a moderated discussion. Uh, after that, we will have a working lunch, followed by uh, the second uh, session about the policy and regulatory frameworks. Uh, we are uh, expecting our guest speaker, who hasn't arrived yet, Dr. Abdullah Karam, who is the Director General of the Knowledge and Human Development Authority of Dubai. Uh, and our uh, uh, dear uh, Professor Ghada Barsoum, Associate Professor, Department of Public Policy and Administration, the American University in Cairo. Uh, following this, we will have a moderated uh, discussion and the closing uh, remarks. Uh, I thank you and I wish you all uh, a wonderful uh, day. Uh, we all are here to uh, understand and learn and be more aware about uh, IBCs and I'm sure that we will achieve this objective. Dr. Jason, would you please? Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, how did I say this on? Good morning. There we go. Well, I am delighted to be here. Dean Beret, Mr. President, Your Excellency. I appreciate the invitation to be part of this very important conversation today. My name is Jason Lane, and I come at this topic from a couple of different angles, and I think it's important to put that perspective out there. Uh, I, first and foremost, I am both a faculty member and an administrator. And as an administrator, I served as the Vice Provost and Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for the State University of New York, which is an institution that has 64 campuses and about 600,000 students, and an array of international presences around the world, including a branch campus in Korea, which I helped set up uh, and create. So I was on the ground making something happen. As a faculty member, I have studied branch campuses now for more than 10 years. Uh, my colleague Kevin Kinzer and I created something called the Cross-Border Education Research Team. Uh, back around 2008, 2009, and this was right in, in the gold rush era of branch campuses, we think, in sort of the 2000s when everybody was getting into this, and everybody was excited about it. Uh, it was sort of a new phenomenon that was occurring. And we now track branch campuses around the world. We have the largest comprehensive set of data about branch campuses compared to anybody else. Uh, we track them regularly. Our website is under construction at the moment, but on seabird.org, you can go and, and we try to maintain an, an up-to-date list of what's happening worldwide around branch campuses. Uh, we consult widely with institutions, with governments, and with uh, non-governmental organizations such as, such as UNESCO and OECD on trends related to branch campuses. And, and what I want to talk a little bit about today, I'll, I'll share some data. Some of it was provided by the, His Excellency already from two reports that we co-wrote with the Observatory for Borderless Higher Education. Uh, one is a 2016 report which talks about trends and data, sort of what's happening right now, state of affairs. Uh, and the other one is one we released last December, uh, which looked at what is the nature of success when we think about international branch campuses. 
And in that report, we did a deep dive into institutions that have been around for at least 10 years, uh, and institutions that have successfully maintained themselves and grown over that period of time and to try to understand what were the factors that helped them be successful, and there might be some lessons learned for this forum today. Branch campuses are an interesting phenomenon. They tend to capture headlines. And these are some of the headlines that you might see uh, recently. A uh, new headline came out this week. If you have seen, I think it was the Dutch University, uh, Grottigan uh, pulled out of an arrangement it had with China that it was going to set up a branch campus there, but they had concerns over academic freedom. And so they decided not to move forward with that initiative. This is a, a market that is still very volatile. There's a lot of interest in it, but there's also a lot of concern about whether or not it's going to be sustainable over time. And so you see on the ground lots of situations where branches may be successful, but you also see a lot of failures. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So my caution here is proceed, but proceed wisely and, and carefully and with your eyes wide open about what the trials and tribulations are in creating a branch campus. These are both academic adventures and economic ventures. And that is an issue for a lot of academics that's hard to gra grapple with. As institutions, as universities, we often don't think about the economic side of education. And so when we think about partnering with academics, we can also be fickle partners because we really don't fully understand what it takes to create a startup organization, which is essentially what a branch campus is. Most of the entities that get into the branch campus world have been around for 100 years or more. They don't remember what it was like to create a whole new organization. Uh, our host here understands some of this by moving to a new campus. There's a lot of trouble when you uproot yourself from one side of town to the other and create something almost afresh and anew. Now think about that when you move from one country to another. When you are taking what was created in one, one country under one set of guidelines, one set of rules, one set of culture, and transplanting that to an entirely different location, there are a lot of concerns and obstacles about how to do that and how to do that well. What do we know about branches? Uh, we've updated the data a little bit. There are now 263 known branch campuses around the world. And I say known because nobody track, no government tracks this data very well. Uh, which is why we put together our database. But we know that there are 263 IBCs currently in operation around the world. There are probably more we just don't know about. Uh, we uncover them all the time and often in very uh, out of the way places like Kazakhstan, where, where we may not understand the language, but we are trying to get a better sense of what's happening there. Many Russian institutions have branches as part of the old Soviet uh, enterprise. Uh, there are 33 countries that are exporting IBCs to 76. So this is a truly global phenomenon. They, the flows are multi-directional. It's not just from the West to the rest of the world. We see a growing number of institutions in the East are now exporting themselves to other countries. China is now becoming uh, a, a, a very interested in exporting their, their institutions to other parts of the world. They, they set up a campus in, in Malaysia recently, for example. Uh, there are 42 IBCs that have known to be closed. These are institutions that set up for whatever reason, weren't successful. Some of them were around for a few months. Some of them were around for a couple of decades, but closed over time. And I'll talk a little bit about what we learned from studying failures. We, there are 22 IBCs that are known to be in development. So this continues to be an interesting phenomenon. People continue to be interested in this. They want to engage in it. Uh, they see it as something that is viable and valuable. And uh, as is excellently mentioned, there are, we think there are, uh, there are at least 180,000 students enrolled in IBCs around the world. It's a very large number when you think about, about it. Um, these are students who are choosing to attend an institution from a foreign country, but not in that foreign country. And we think this, this likely undercounts, but I know it undercounts. As we were talking earlier, our numbers from Liverpool undercount the actual numbers from Liverpool, and we'll, we'll hear about that. This is a growth chart. So if you look on the left-hand side, what you have are the dates. And on the right hand, and as it moves that way is the growth. But what you see essentially, if I got this, there we go. On this side, there was very little growth in, in the early years. Uh, one of the earliest known IBCs was the 1920s. It was actually Parsons Fashion School out of New York, set up a campus in Paris. Uh, we don't have that up here because it, sort of it wasn't worth it to put it on, on this, this sheet. But the next earliest one was the 1960s when the uh, jo Johns Hopkins University set up a campus in Bologna. 
Italy. This was after World War II. The effort there was to bring it in a foreign campus to help Europe heal itself. And so they brought over their international relations program to bring diplomats from across Europe together in a sort of neutral place to learn with each other about diplomacy and to work together. That was where they came from. But you can see in this period of time, substantial growth has occurred sort of in the 2000s up until now. And if we think about it uh, in terms of branch campuses by a five-year period of time, 1996 to 2000, there were about 35 new branch campuses that opened that period of time. And that was when we really first began to see places like Malaysia and Dubai become interested in branch campuses. But really 2000 to 2010 is what I refer to as the gold rush. This was a period of time when there were a lot of countries that were very interested in importing branch campuses. Qatar, Singapore, Hong Kong, we think about them separately from China. Uh, China then got into this game and a, a lot of institutions that were set up and a lot of them failed during this period of time because they decided to get into a branch campus without thinking through what that actually meant. They were very excited about the prospect. It was neat, it was exciting, it was something cool to do. We wanted to be the first one in. And so without fully do, doing due diligence, they set up shop and they found out that operating in a different country was very different than operating in their home country. And they, they closed. So the, the definition, which I was thrilled to hear His Excellency say, because I wrote it, so I'm a little bit biased, uh, of branches, apparently they did not want me to say it, uh, is an entity that is owned at least in part by a foreign higher education provider, operated in the name of the foreign education provider, and provides an entire academic program substantially on site, leading to a degree awarded by the foreign education provider. I want to unpack this a little bit because there's some nuance in here that's important. Because we were very, very careful in how we chose to define a branch campus, and a lot of it had to do with quality. We wanted to make sure we were differentiating from twinning programs, which were situations where the, the home campus really didn't involve itself in the curriculum and the development of the curriculum. They were uh, essentially uh, uh, franchising out their degree without actually being very involved in it. We Branch campuses are different. The idea here essentially is that the foreign provider has a vested interest in this partnership. And by vested interest, they have some level of ownership in it, which means they have, they have capital in the game somehow. Maybe not fully, but at least partially. That their name is on it that it is their name and it is their institution that is awarding the degree program, which basically means they are, they are responsible for the quality and the integrity of the program. It's an entire academic program. This isn't a situation where you can get half the degree there and half online. It isn't a two plus two where you can spend two years in one campus and go to another. This is where you can get the entire degree program there in that institution. Uh, substantially on site. And so uh, we do provide some allowance for perhaps some, a little bit of online programming. Very little, but it, that's not the whole thing. And there might be a requirement or two to go back home at times to get a, pick up a course or two, but substantially you have to be able to do the, the program on site at the branch campus. Uh, and the degree is actually awarded by the foreign education provider. There are other types of cross-border education, right? This is not the only type. You have choices. Right? And you don't have to stick with our definition. We're researchers, so we had to have a definition so we could decide what's in and what's out. When we count things, but there are, you know, you can set up locations where essentially you're providing online education on site. People can come and you, I can teach you from New York here in Cairo, right? Via interactive television, via some sort of online provision, whatever that might be, you can set up a physical space to make that happen. Uh, there are subsidiary locations where you're not granting a degree, but you're providing other services or other sorts of engagements or offices. Uh, within SUNY, for example, we have offices in Mexico and Russia and in Turkey. We don't provide whole degree programs. But we provide some courses, some services to people who are there. Uh, there's a partnership operations. These are campuses that are co-founded or established by a local and a foreign university uh, in partnership with each other where it's not fully the institution, but there is a, a partnership that is arranged. Uh, an example of this is a new medical school that was founded in Malaysia that was uh, a joint effort between Johns Hopkins University and a, and a Malaysian entity there. Uh, Multi-state institutions where campuses in different countries, but there's no home campus. Um, there are some 
uh, Laureate International, for example, is a global conglomerate of educational institutions that doesn't have a single home campus. It is essentially a corporate entity that owns campuses around the world, but there is no sort of home designation. Uh, or you can create an entirely new institution, foreign backed by control and operate in the name of the new institution. I think of this like the G German University here in Cairo, uh, where essentially there is a, uh, a, an investment from afar, but it's an entirely new institution that is here and is not necessarily tied to a home campus where there is the academic control and quality that's in place. When we think about home countries, where, who's sending these things abroad? Uh, they come from 33 different countries. We've seen about an 18% increase um, from the 28 home countries that's since the end of 2010. So we tend to see new countries coming into this space, thinking about it. The top five are the US, the UK, Russia, France, and Australia. And I saw recently that you all signed an agreement with the UK uh, in this space, which I think was a wise move. Uh, together, those five account for 181 of the branch campuses that are known, so that more than half of all branch campuses come from those five places. Um, and around half of the IBCs currently in development are either from the U US or UK. So the US and the UK continue to be the most active in this space. And so if we mapped it out, it looks something like this. All right, these are, these are the campuses that, the countries that are, are um, exporting branches. You can see the US, Russia uh, is another major one. China is really growing in this space. Uh, Australia was one of the earliest uh, in, into the, in the environment. Host countries, who are actually hosting these things? Where do they sit? There are 76 different countries that have a branch campus around the world. It's about a 10% increase from the 69 that we counted in 2010. So we also see a diver an increasing di diversification of host, ho host campuses. Uh, China, the UAE, Singapore, Malaysia, and Qatar uh, are the top five importers of branch campuses. Uh, China and the UAE sort of go back and forth in terms of who has more. It's kind of hard to count. They sort of vary over time, but they're sort of at the top in terms of who, who hosts more. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about, about that in a minute. But those five host about 40% of all of the branch campuses in the world. Um, and the IBC has continued to increase with concentrated growth really sort of in, in, in Asia. Uh, China, Malaysia, China, Malaysia, uh, Mauritius, uh, South Korea, the ones where we see a lot of growth happening right now, and Egypt will add to that list, right, in a couple of years. And this is what it looks like when you map it out. If you think about those five countries I just mentioned, and you think about growth in terms of over time, this is what it would look like. You can see the U.S. dominates the space by far. Then the UK, right? And then France, interesting, Russia and Australia. Australia is what has been in the space for a long time, but they haven't really increased. They got into this in the mid 1990s, but they haven't really done much more since then. Host countries, this is what we, we look at. Um, the UAE kind of goes, you see this rapid shoot up there of orange, and then it sort of has been stable since then. Some in and out uh, happening over time, but it's sort of stabilized. Uh, China is the one now where you see the most significant amount of growth occurring. Uh, and in fact, we were recently doing some more research on this. We think we are substantially undercounting the number of branches that are in China, even relative to this 32. We think it actually may be upwards around 60 or 70, um, based upon some new definitions that are coming out and looking into the Chinese regulations on this. The uh, Singapore has sort of stabilized itself, as has Qatar. These are both places that had growth in the, uh, the mid-2000s. But they sort of are where they want to be. That's, uh, they're sort of plateauing a little bit. Uh, then you see down here South Korea and Mauritius, and, and both of them are interested in growing more. We'll see what actually happens. Uh, Mauritius has recently had a couple of closures occur. Uh, it, while a great destination for vacation, it uh, wasn't necessarily viewed as a great destination for education. Uh, they were hoping that the sun and the beaches were to attract people. That hasn't quite been the case. Uh, South Korea, we all know the, uh, the instability in the Korean Peninsula is raising concerns, I think, among people to go there. In fact, we, we launched a new program in SUNY Korea there last November, and there was a lot of concern even then about whether or not we should be postponing that or not. We went forward with it. We felt it was important to do that. We were committed. But there was a lot of discussion behind the scenes about what this volatility in the Korean Peninsula means. So 
uh, there is a lot of, lot of concern among branch campuses about sort of what's happening on the ground. Uh, one of the things that we look at is just sort of what is the, the ratio of international branch campuses to the overall higher education provision in a home country. Uh, we, just to sort of understand sort of how big is it. So you can see for Australia, IB, the ratio of IBCs to nationally recognized institutions is about 10%, which is pretty substantial actually. A lot of, you know, about 10% of their institutions are overseas, essentially in this case. But it, it's, it's a fairly small number. I think the more interesting data is this when you look at where we've seen growth in institutions. In, the, in Qatar, for example, 73% of the institutions in Qatar are, are international branch campuses. Right? A substantial number of the higher ed capacity is foreign in Qatar. In the UAE, it's about 43%. No, 42%. Qatar and, and UAE are, are unique in some ways also. Right? They have a very large expatriate population. Right? In Dubai and in Abu, in Abu Dhabi, you have Estimates of around somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the population actually being national citizens, leaving about 80 to 90 percent of the population being expatriate, people very interested in getting a degree from elsewhere as well. Um, why do institutions want branch campuses? These are sort of the four reasons that we've come up with. One is internationalization. Significant interest now in being global entities. They want to be globally engaged, and part of that global engagement is to have a presence elsewhere in the world which gives them a more substantial international footprint. Uh, we hope that it also helps internationalize the home campus and that there's co-learning that occurs between the two campuses. A lot of people say revenue. They see this as a revenue-making endeavor. If you're getting into this for the money, stop now. Stop. These are not gonna make lots of money. The home campuses have learned that these, they, 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 the hope is to break even and be sustainable over time, but these are an investment in the ed building educational capacity. Most of these endeavors are not major money-making endeavors. They may get there eventually, but right now that is not the case. And I, I think it would be a long time off before it happens. And there might be a few exceptions. Status enhancement, part of it's reputational, right? I've got a branch campus in somewhere else in the world. I'm in a very interesting part of the, part of the world. Uh, I want to be there because it enhances my status or my reputation. And in academia, reputation and prestige is the coin of the realm. And so we want to do things that increase our prestige and our reputation. Uh, and sometimes they have existing connections. They know somebody, it's an interesting endeavor, my alumni, I have an uh, alumni member who is the minister, that's why I wanna go and get involved and be part of that, that experience. Why they don't do it? You'll end up running into more institutions who don't wanna do it than do. Even though we talk about branch campuses, what's so interesting about this phenomenon is that branch campuses have become so important, I think, in sort of the public discourse around internationalization, is that now institutions have to explain why they don't do it instead of why they do it, even though it's a very small percentage of internationalization activities, but it doesn't fit with the mission, right? It's not who they are, it's not what they want to do, it's not, where they're, they're, it's not part of their being as an institution. They're too expensive and too risky. There's a lot of risk associated with any sort of startup, particularly in this space, and so they're concerned about whether or not they can actually do it or not. There's not a clear and financially sustainable business model. A lot of times, branch campuses got into this without really understanding what the business model looked like. It just sounded cool and interesting, so let's go do it. And they didn't really think through what the revenue was gonna look like, how they were gonna be sustainable over time. Uh, the lack, lack of buy-in from the home institution. I'm gonna talk more about this in a minute, but this is big. If you don't have substantial buy-in from the home institution, which includes everybody from faculty up through senior administrators, the likelihood that it will fail is high. A lot of the failures or the institutions that have pulled out have done so because they didn't have buy-in from faculty or from senior administrators or even from alumni to do this work. University of Connecticut was committed to going into Dubai about 10 years ago. They pulled out because the alumni didn't want it. Once they learned that this was happening, they said, no, don't go, and so the institution pulled out of it. The, the reason why the University of Groton pulled out this week from the China endeavor was the faculty weren't consulted and they were concerned about academic freedom. And the institutional leaders know if they don't have the faculty commitment, they're not gonna be able to sustain it over time. So you've gotta make sure whoever your partner is, that there is wholesale buy-in from throughout the institution. Concern that the failure could damage the institution's reputation, right, if this thing goes south, what happens? how it will affect what's happening on the home campus. And one of the overriding themes that we've learned from our research is that institutions are very protectionist of the home campus first. Right? That, is where, that is who they are centrally, and so they want to make sure that nothing happens that will 
uh, adversely affect the branch campus, which is, can be a, a problem on operating these things. Uh, they don't want to dilute institutional brand, their academic freedom, and, and the champion leave or the institution loses interest. And so that's why buy-in is important. Why do countries get into this business? This isn't just an institutional saying, I want to go do this. A lot of the growth is because because nations are moving into this space. They, w they see it as a way to develop ep economically. They bring in a new institution. They can help develop their educational in infrastructure. They can produce more students, more knowledge workers. They can create new innovations and new research. Um, they can help leapfrog the development of their own educational system. Instead of investing nationally, they say, let's bring in somebody that's already well ahead of where we are and have them come in, set up shop, and show us how to do it. I'm not saying that's why you're doing it. I'm saying these are some of the reasons that are out there for it. Uh, and there's also a public diplomacy soft power aspect of this uh, that fits into it as well. Uh, increasingly, universities are important so soft power entities. And countries are seeking to associate themselves with institutions that have global brands because it can help them in the soft power diplomatic space. It's out there. All right. Type of IBCs, if we think about this from what a size and scope, just quickly, uh, type one, type two, type three, type one is where you have one to five academic programs in place. Type three is where you have 20 plus programs. You can see a majority of uh, institutions are really in the very small grouping of institutions here. They've had one to five academic programs, very focused, very deliberate in their choice of institutions. There are very few that are large scale, broadly offering academic programs in a number of, of different areas, about 7.6. About five minutes, okay. All right, I'm gonna jump through this very, very quickly. Uh, start with a master's program. Just to say this, one of the most important aspects of a branch campus is having students graduate from that program. Once students graduate from the program, then they see it as something that's legitimate. Up until that, it's risky for them. So start with a program that's very, very focused. The UK is a little bit easier than the US because they have a three-year focus program versus our four-year, more interdisciplinary nature. Uh, I often suggest starting with a master's program first so you get students in, get them out, get them focused. Um, size and age are not connected. And the more programs you have, the more students you have. It's sort of the no duh conclusion, but we ran the data on this uh, just very, very quickly. Johns Hopkins Bologna, you can see, is one of the smallest institutions. This looks at age and students. Liverpool, which was founded in 2006, is the largest. In fact, this undercounts Liverpool's numbers, I just realized, but it's about 9,000 versus 7,000. More new data that we're doing is actually trying to understand research productivity of branch campuses. Are these really research endeavors or not? We found that about 93 of them have produced at least 10 publications so far, which is huge, but there's a lot of criticism that these are not research enterprises, and we found that some of them actually are pretty substantial research enterprises. Uh, and if you think about the contribution of IBCs to the research uh, quality overall, all oh, you can tell by Cutter. Uh, the most I mean, has the most substantial uh, contributions from branch campuses in terms of research. And then the UAE and Malaysia and so forth, I can talk more about this as well. It's also a great way to build connections with local institutions when you have a branch campus, is you see greater collaboration between local academics and international academics. Uh, lessons from famous failures of what to avoid, lack of due diligence, do your homework. Understand what the conditions are on the ground. Understand if you actually have students who are academically viable for competing in your programs, uh, who can be able to attend these institutions. Understanding the local culture. I often tell institutions in the US, when you leave the US, you're not in the US anymore. They forget that, right? When you come to the Middle East, it's a very different culture. And you've got to understand how you're gonna adapt your culture to the environment that is here. This is, uh, uh, I spent a year living in Dubai studying branch campuses, this was hard for a lot of the branch campuses there to understand that, that single uh, important issue of culture. Global brand, does not rec re does <laughs> global brand recognition does not translate into local br brand recognition. Just because you have a global name doesn't mean you can hang a shingle at the door in a new location and expect people to show up. You still have to be on the ground promoting yourself, marketing yourself, and building a local reputation. Students are smart enough to realize that when Michigan State left East Lansing, it was no longer Michigan State in the same way which is one of the reasons why they were not successful in Dubai. Uh, overcharging in the marketplace. You've got to realize that you have to be competitive in your local marketplace. A lot of institutions will say, well, our policy is that we have a out-of-state tuition rate and an in-state tuition rate, and everyone out-of-state has to pay the same rate. Well, if you're going to be in Egypt, you have to be competing locally. 
And that's what led to a lot of failures where they outpriced themselves in the market. And the aged bureaucracy of an academic institution does not understand the young startup. They just, they don't get it. It's hard for them to realize that you have to adjust your policies and your practices. When you've had 100 years of doing it one way, it's hard for an institution to change and accept that change over time. Um, I know I'm at time. I got five quick questions I'm gonna run through without talking about them. But these are the things to think about we're already, who owns the building or the facilities, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be the institution itself, but who, this is the biggest startup cost, is the facilities themselves. Who will actually invest in this to make this happen? Chances are the branch campus will not. They will not have the, the money to do it, so you've got to think about who, who invests. What does the corporate structure look like? What does the governance actually look like? One of the things we've learned from failures is you have to have firewalls between the corporate side and the, the, the money side and the academic side. As soon as those who are in control of the money start telling the academics what to do, it's, a, it's an equation for failure because what happens is we reduce quality to get more people in the door, and when you reduce quality, then you reduce your brand recognition, and you end up failing. It's a downward spiral. What will the student experience look like? Right? Just because you're saying you're going to have a branch campus here does not mean it's going to look the same as it does uh, overseas. Texas A&M, for example, and Cutter was very, very clear about what they wanted to do in terms of replicating their culture, their student culture, because they have an institution that is very, very proud of the student experience there. And so they were very purposeful in sort of how they brought their traditions over, how they replicated that student experience. Uh, the, is there institutional buy-in? Uh, and I've already talked about this already, but from the institutions that we have studied, there's a clear institutional commitment from the top down into this engagement. There's a self-definition that doesn't identify these as branch campuses, that they are part of the institution. They're a global network that matters, that there's collaborative leadership, that they measure success. They actually track the data and they try to improve themselves all the time and they emphasize quality over profit. And number five, or actually that was four. Uh, what does the internal concept, context look like? And then what does the country context look like? Uh, this is an important one, and I know that we're going to talk about this later on, but one of the most important things for this country uh, to think about is what do you want in a branch campus, and how are you regulated? Is it a local entity where you expect them to uh, comply with local regulations, or is it truly an international entity where you want it to look just like it did at home, exactly the same as it did at home? Dubai will not, not allow an academic program to be created at a branch campus unless it is at the home campus already. Or is there some continuing in, 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 uh, continuing in between? I know my, 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 my colleague, uh, Dr. Abdullah Karam, is going to talk about this later when, when he is here. But there's, that's an important question is, what do you want? What do you as Egypt want in a branch campus? And what do you want it to look like? I'm done.